Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, we've decided that I am opposition and Jeremy Heron is government. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of you here. Uh, welcome to the pre-performance talk uh, for this house. Uh, my name is Kate Moss. I'm a novelist and a playwright and the biographer of CFT and have a slightly extra hat on tonight as the deputy chair of the National Theatre uh, because this production is going to start here and then it is going into the Garrick Theatre and it is a co-production with the National Theatre and, of course, with Headlong, of which Jeremy Heron is the artistic director. Um, before we start, can I ask who has seen it um, already here? All those who have seen it before say aye. You haven't seen it before, say no. Do you think the no's have it? The no's have it. <laughs> and who is going in this evening? Oh, brilliant. Okay, we'll try not to spoil anything, although, to be honest, uh, I think most of us know what happened between 1974 and 1979. Um, Jeremy, welcome back. Thank you. It's fantastic to have you back here um, in the Minerva. Now, this was a new play, James Graham... 2012 in yeah. the Cottesloe, as yeah. it then was, Dorfman now it is, and then was such a success, we sold every ticket, so it went into the Olivier and was a sellout there. Yeah. What's it like coming back to something that was such a big play when you did it, but actually it's not really very far on to do a revival? What's no, it like I mean, it's only back? about three years. I suppose it all came about because we were very close. We, the business was so good in the Cottesloe that we went to the Olivier, and then the business was so good in the Olivier that, that we, you know, we felt that there was a real desire for people to see this show and to, in, you know, enjoy it. It's such a brilliant bit of writing. And so we were right on the cusp of transferring it to the Aldwych. And just at the last minute, after we, I think we'd done all the agreements with the actors and the creative team's availability was all in place, um, Andrew, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber changed his mind about his dates because of something going on with a musical that he'd written called Stephen Ward, and that that offer to the theatre owners was too good to refuse. So we got pipped at the post and we got pushed out of... I'm not going to make a joke about that, no. obviously. No, but I've got about 10 minutes of material, so I'll just, <laughs> I'll just keep going about that. Um, and what was extremely pleasing about that, and actually the, another show that I did, the Hilary Mantel novels, that um, some of the actors that are in this house came and joined and we collaborated on, the Wolf Hall plays, uh, that was the play that um, kicked Stephen Ward out of the Aldwych. <laughs> so there's a sort of level of Cromwellian revenge <laughs> yeah. in there that, um, that was pleasing. But uh, it's, to go back to the main point, it always felt that there, was a, that there was enough sort of fuel in the play and how the play talks to the culture and the audience just basically having um, what they felt was a, was a really good time. Um, uh, you know for a play that at first glance doesn't look like it's going to be the most appetising and sort of entertaining um, evening. Apparently when James um, took the idea to Nick Heitner, the, the National said to him, you know, you know, come and write a play for us. And he went in for a meeting and he said to, uh, Nick Heitner said to James, so what have you got? And James said, well, I've got a play about the Whips office uh, in the Labour government 1974 to 1979. And then Nick said, have you got anything else? Because <laughs> it doesn't sound like the most exciting show, but I think that's James's genius and, and also the, the kind of, the, you know, the stormy excitement of the time was that uh, in terms of my generation, and I'm about 10 years older than James, certainly James's generation, it was a story that we'd missed, but everyone that had lived through that time, it was full of characters and very vivid and, and a really brilliant way, he thought, to examine the limitations and possibilities of our eccentric parliamentary process. And when we first did it, of course, we were just trying to understand what um, a hung parliament was like and coalition politics. And so the play seemed very apposite in those terms. But we now realize that the play is, is um, just, it's a, it's a classic play, I think, because in examining a particular period, it, it shows some light on on what's happening now. And it feels like now with what's happening in um, you know, the United Kingdom and what that is, what's happening in terms of our relationship to Europe, what's happening within each of our political parties and how they're attempting to reform themselves and, and continue the, the fight and get back to the ideolo to ideology, that this play you know, illuminates that and illuminates, um, possibly challenges our prejudices about, 
about where we are. So it felt like it was a really important play to, um, to, to try and revive, that there was a hunger there for it. And because of my relationship with um, Chichester and Jonathan's generosity, he, Jonathan Church, said, come back and do something in our last season. Um, what do you want to do? And I said, I've got a very, very expensive <laughs> thing that I want to do. So he generously he saw the show and loved it and was all for supporting it the first time around. And so he said, yeah, come and do it, and then we'll, we'll get a group together and we'll see if we can take it in the, in, into the West End. So between Chichester and Headlong and Karen Euling and NYMAX, we formed this lovely coalition to, uh, <laughs> to, to take it to the Garrick in November. So, uh, yeah, it's been brilliant. Speaking of illuminating, much as I love to be in the spotlight, uh, do you want to turn your torch off? Because um, <laughs> you're sort of shining on me. In a, in I was a very... trying to see what was happening out there. We've got a new bit of set today. And um, my colleagues were going to light it, but the light isn't on. So when, if you're coming back tonight, have a little look above the entrance and let's see if we've managed to locate the light and turn the light on. One of the things you were saying, doing. James, when we were just chatting before, um, was the sense of how hard it is this close to opening night, which is tomorrow here and then obviously in November in the Garrick, to see the play as a whole thing. So it's right down to the detail above the door, the fantastic thing many of you will have seen, uh, the front of house staff dressed as uh, members of the House of Commons Entertainment uh, Committee, um, all of these sorts of things. So once you're um, in a new space, you know this space very well. Many of the actors are old Chichester hands as well. Half of the cast was from the original productions and now you have some more. Once you're in here, how much does the production that you did change? How much of a new production is this? Or is it genuinely a right revival, but slightly blocked differently? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I suppose the play is the same, um, but the production is new because it's, it involves new people. And even, even, even you know, the, the half of the cast that were involved before, they have to behave differently because the, you know, the energy from their new colleagues is different. And it took, takes a while to become its own thing. And actually, the preview pro progress and rehearsals have been really, really great. But it takes, these things take a while for everybody to land in the same shared reality and, and the same physical space. And it felt like, last night felt like we, that we'd sort of worked it all out. The thing about this show is there's so many bits. You know, it's like a very sort of intricate and complicated um, bit of machinery with all sorts of cogs that have to were and click together and, and um, come together and the whole, th the whole mechanism doesn't quite work unless each of those cogs are working together from the 16 members of the cast to the three members of the band to uh, Laura the DSM, who's, it's gotta be one of the most complicated shows to call because the difference in timing um, you know, lights up on a particular scene. It's just very, very intricate and you know, if it was a, if it, you know, if it was a, if it was another sort of project, we'd be talking about um, mission fail. You know, each of those cues could be mission fail. You know, suddenly the audience is pulled out of um, what we're trying to do technically, and they're thinking about it as a piece of theatre rather than engaging in the stories. And in order for that to to happen, it's incredibly detailed. And just for something like that, with so many people working together, it takes a it takes a long period of time. So I think. To answer your question, it's got to be new because it's here and it's now with this combination of people. However, what, what um, I entered into it in a, with a slightly different feeling, which was I know that we'd made a success of it twice before. So the first time we did it, um, we just thought a little bit like that story about Nick Heitner saying, have you got anything else? We weren't convinced at all that anybody would get it or enjoy it. For, for those people who haven't yet seen it, the, one of the things you will know for obviously the wonderful company that Jeremy runs headlong is there is an element of physical and interpretive theatre which is not uh, strictly naturalistic. And so there is this wonderful, what looks like a traditional Chichester set, and then there is your fingerprint on it, yeah. which is a very different sort of thing. Just for those of you who haven't yet seen it, do you want to just explain a, a little bit about that? This right. sort of the naturalism. Sweaty inverted. fingerprint. I, um, I, I don't think I use the word yeah, sweaty. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think I suppose the thing about Headlong is that it's. I, I always like to think of it as a company that um, that can really prosthetize the possibilities of theatre, so that we really um, 
if you were introducing somebody to theatre for the first time, that they would come away from the evening thinking that it was very dynamic and very um, active and very exciting art form. Um, but it's, not, it's no more intentional than that just being my taste. Actually, it's all about serving the play. And so, for example, you'll see tonight, if you haven't seen it before, and those of you that have seen it will remember that the opening sequence is a kind of bit of choreography, a bit of dance, a bit of movement, which seems completely unlikely. And there's something about um, getting a company of people who, let's face it, largely middle-aged men doing some contemporary dance as a way of summoning up the spirit of parliamentary democracy. There's something really, <laughs> there's something really exciting about that. But also what it says to the audience is um, we're not sort of mimetically... Um, uh, trying to represent reality. We're doing, a, we're doing a version of it. We're doing an essence of it. We're going to take some narrative shortcuts. We're going to do uh, some things that are just expressive to get an idea across. And we're not going to be bogged down in, in realism. And uh, I'm sure that you can tell already, for those of you that haven't seen it, that the set is a classic composite set. It's trying to do several things at once. So Yes, we're trying to represent some offices, but we're also trying to represent the kind of romance, the possibilities or the familiarity of, uh, of the House of Commons. So it's all about just... I think it probably comes from someone like me having a slightly short attention span and um, wanting a glut of information at all times and just uh, desiring... I mean, my taste is that, that storytelling should be collegiate in every aspect of every production if it isn't pointing the audience in the right direction to plug into the narrative, thematic, emotional possibilities of a show, then it should be changed to do that. Um, and you know, the, the process that we've been on as a company has been about trying to refine that, trying to get, you know, get it into the company's bodies, allowing them to express their characters in a way that absolutely contributes mm -hmm. to the main flow of mm -hmm. the drama. Well, um, I, I've seen all the versions so far and I I mean I would say this wouldn't I um, but I don't know what you're going to say I'm, that this is the best oh good no I mean <laughs> I've enjoyed I've enjoyed it every time yeah. but there is something about it in this particular space which yeah. is incredibly thrilling um, and you have live music and you have all of these things can I just bring you back to something you said a bit earlier about um, the, the politics of it yeah that on the one hand those of us who are of a certain age will remember the lights going out at six o'clock, uh, you know, the winter of discontent, the leading to the Lib Lag Pact, all of these things. But how different is it now when some of the lines that are said in the play, which is the same text, could have been written for yesterday, more than they could have been yeah. in 2012? How does that change it for you as a director? Does it change it at all that it seems to be very clearly speaking to the issues that mattered. The EU comes up quite a lot, although it's a different way round. There are things about what proportional representation, how voting works. This is all, if anything, more current than it was. I suppose it's, I suppose it's absolutely a tribute to James's play. When we, when we were building up to the, the revival, we were getting excited about it. Um, I thought, oh, fantastic, because of what was happening with the, de you know, the recent devolution bills and um, it was sort of pre-Brexit, but we, you know, we were talking about the referendum and all of that. And I thought, it'd be really fantastic, and we'll get James to write a whole lot of new stuff that'll make it all topical. And then we, we read it again in preparation for the new production and thought, actually, this, this is the story of that time. And it resonates because it was true to that time. And it resonates because what he's remarkably... I mean, he's a remarkable writer with an amazing brain he looks about 14 you know he look, it's completely unlikely but um he he's so on top of the politics and what what the politics of this time how they speak to the kind of essential uh the, the essential ideas that any any drama about a british um political process and history speaks to you know it talks about the tension between um principle and pragmatism it talks about the essentially adversarial nature of our system, the, 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 the lack of a kind of, uh, how coalition is weird for us when it isn't for our, emotion, uh, uh, our, our European neighbors. Um, that he's just speaking so clearly about the fundamentals 
and reflecting it in that time, to go out of that and to make it topical is to deny how thorough a job he did the first time. So there's been a couple of things that we've changed, but we would have, I'm sure we would have changed them had we had more time to rehearse it the last time. I mean, that's the, the other thing that's really great about um, a revival is you just get more time to work on it. And I think, you know, like most, I mean, I'm sure it's the same um, with your writing, Kate, that at some point you've just got to hand it over. Otherwise, the process just continues, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's time to move on to it's the never next done. thing. It's never done. And um, I have to get dragged out of here. I'll be dragged out of here on um, Thursday night and told never to return because I could already feel it this afternoon, actually, with the actors, with me picking around with kind of ti the tiniest details. They were like, yeah, okay. Time for the director can, yeah, to leave Dodge. That. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah. So it's definitely time for me just to let them, you know, hand it over. Do, do you think um, that it's at the heart of it, a play about the morality or the immorality of politics? I don't know. Well, to me, yes, it could be about that. And I think what's wonderful about it is that you can engage with it in all sorts of different ways. At the moment, I'm thinking about it as a play that explores the possibility of honour in politics and, and where that sits and, and how fit a parliamentary process is for our experience of being human and uh, you know, making the best, whatever side of the ideological house we're on. I think it's fair to say that most people in politics get in, into it for good reasons. They want to affect their quality of life for their communities, their country, for the better. There are a few show ponies that, you know, that wants to further themselves, um, or further their own ambition. But generally, the, the system is, is grueling and challenging enough. Um, and you know, there's a level of inspection even more so now than the period that we're talking about in this house. That unless you're really serious about it, you're putting yourself up for a massive amount of um, you know, invasion of your privacy and you know, very difficult working hours. So I think it, it, it explores whether the, whether the system that we've slowly evolved over years and years suits us. And it asks a lot of questions. I think it probably ends up relatively favorable about that. Um, I know that James is interested in you know, he approves of the whips. He thinks that that's as good a way as any of doing it. He likes the adversarial uh, way of, a, of our first past the post. I mean, how that changes with, as the makeup of our um, country changes and, you know, the left don't have enough seats to be mm, possibly a sort of yeah, an alternative. Yeah. Um, that might change. So. One of the things that also that struck me even more watching it last night than it had on previous occasions was that there was, at the heart of it, this, these strong relationships. The two chief whips who were played wonderfully by Phil Daniels, who was in your original company, and then a very, an actor very beloved of, of yeah. Chai, uh, Malcolm Sinclair here, but also the deputy whips, which is the emotional heart yeah. in the form of Stefan Rodri and Nathaniel Parker. Now, when you're casting something yeah. like this, are you pinning it on those four to start with? Or actually, do you think of it as an ensemble piece? Because for me, it was it's kind of about male piece. friendship, yeah. actually. It's, it's definitely an ensemble piece. I mean, it's, it's everything, like I was saying before, everything is properly connected, rhythmically, you know. And the, I think, um, you know, that's been, that's been the, the learning process over the last week or so for people that are new to it, thinking that actually their job is to represent their character, truthfully. Yes, that is part of your job, but the rest of it is to tee up the narrative for everybody else and play together as, as you would um, in an orchestra or you know, another sort of very sort of visible example of playing in an ensemble. So you've just got to cast everybody really well. Um, it became, I mean, certainly those characters you would cast in relation to each other. So we knew that Phil was going to be doing it and therefore we needed a, some sort of energy that would um, oppose that or the yin to Phil's yang and that Malcolm is definitely that. Um, and they're a really brilliant uh, double act and, and likewise um, Stefan and Nat, they're just contra contradictory and complementary energies um, and an ability to represent the kind of the class of their characters and you know, and technically it's kind of it's a it's a challenging play because 
in certain in certain uh, areas, it's, it demands the precision and clarity that you would um, normally insist on with a farce. You know that the timing has to be just so, and the information that the audience gets has to be um, rigorous and completely ordered and very precise. Otherwise, the thing, the, you know, the, the thing just doesn't work. But also, there's a, an emotional in, interior to those characters and a, and a reveal of that at certain points in the uh, in the evening that demands the the greatest acting. Mm. So we're lucky. And. Over the course of these interviews um, during this season, both here and, and over the way in the main house, uh, directors have a different approach to how they encourage or discourage their actors to research. Now, this is complicated because you're right in the moment, the member for this place, the member for that place. It requires us to kind of listen very hard and a certain amount of knowledge but James's play is so brilliant you don't need... So what do you say to the actors? Do you leave it up to them to decide whether they will read Tony Benn's diaries, Barbara Carter's diary, you know, all of that, or do you actually say, if you want to read this book, this would be helpful? Well, I mean, there's a level of research that, you, that, that I suppose you create the climate of the production, which is we start with a lot of research, uh, and then we know what we're talking about, uh, and therefore we're empowered to make artistic decisions thereafter. I think the worst thing is to make artistic de decisions based on nothing. I mean, there are certain things, um, like our voting, for example. The voting that you'll see tonight, or you have seen, is subtly different in the chamber because there are more people involved. Uh, there's a period of time that we don't put the audience through where the votes are collated and put onto one piece of paper. But we do a kind of physical gesture towards the ritual and the rhythm of that in order to, to sell it as an idea. Now, we know that it doesn't start like that. In fact, when we first, when we first started rehearsing it, we probably, had, we probably had 11 or 12 votes over the whole course of the evening. And we just realized narratively there was no point in that. We were putting the audience through this ritual and we were insisting on the ritual being realistic and exactly the same every time. And that, you know, we were just going to, people were going to just want to kill themselves. <laughs> yes. so, we, we, so we did the research. We knew exactly what it entailed. We made artistic choices based on that. And I think that's what it's about. Otherwise, you're stumbling around in the dark and, and um, the choices that you make aren't, aren't smart ones. But yeah, so there's a basic level of research that we all do as, as a company where we're around the table and we had um, Clark, we had clerks from the parliamentary estate come with us and sit around the table and answer our questions. We had visits to House of Commons. We went to the WHIPs office. Uh, we met um, the civil servants that organised things for the WHIPs. We had several MPs and people now in the House of Lords. You know, one of the characters that's portrayed in the evening, Ann Taylor, actually just stepped into our rehearsal room and told us, uh, you know, what it was all about, what it was like. You know, and her sitting across the table from Lauren, who's playing her, was kind of moving and a, a sort of one-off experience. Particularly when she looked at a particular scene, I won't spoil it for you, but there's a particular scene uh, where our fictional Ann Taylor responds to a set of circumstances. Um, and in the first draft, she responded in quite a mild way. And then Ann said, no, it wasn't like that. I was much harder. And I said this. And we just went, oh my God, can we, can we say that? <laughs> well, she said, that's what I said. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big moment quite late in the play. And the audience often gasp. And when you hear that gasp, that's a real, that's a real line. One of the things I noticed last night um, is that it... I mean, it's obviously a very moving play and it's a very thought-provoking play. It's gripping. But it's also very funny in lots of places. Are you, as the director and the company, are you sometimes surprised at the things that you thought were hilarious kind of fall tumbleweed-like into the room and other things the audience is rolling about that you hadn't heard the humour? Does that happen? Sometimes. I mean, in the first thing, the former, um, happens every now and again. And then it's you're into my favourite bit, which is the kind of science of, of comedy. So there was, a, there was a bit that wasn't getting a very big laugh and I realised it's because the audience, something else was happening on stage and the audience weren't hearing the word north. So I suggested to Malcolm that we, he, we just really made sure that they heard the word north and then, you know, that's a, that's a solid laugh. And it's just as simple as, you know, comedy is always information and if they get the right amount of information at the right time, you can kill a joke by taking too long 
which means that the audience is ahead of you and they've already thought it funny and you can kill a joke by doing it too quickly so that they don't quite get it. But that's what timing is all about, is stacking up the right amount of information that, the, that you're just ahead of an audience's thought process so that you're exploding an idea that they're just on the cusp of. Um, and so they're, they're laughed. Um, but yeah, the, the comedy is, is really great. And this is a very challenging space in terms of comedy because you're on three sides. So comedy normally depends on, or like a kind of big, strong laugh with a hard edge at the, at the top of it is normally based on the whole audience getting the information at exactly the same time. So it doesn't quite function like that here. But um, we, uh, I mean, it, and, and that's fine as well because it's not, the success of this doesn't depend on a kind of hit rate of laughs. If the audience wants to laugh, then there's space for them to do so. But, but we don't go out of our way to change reality in order to create humor. We're trying to represent more or less um, real life as it is lived. So. I'm going to go out to the audience to, well, the, uh, the members. I'm going to go out to the members in a moment. Order, too. order. Oh, they, they are being very orderly. We yeah. are nearly back in the speaker's chair, actually. We're sort of going further back. Um, but a final question. Um, when you go back to a project, do you go back with the fear that we all sometimes go back to a beloved novel or a beloved thing where you think maybe this time the thing that was so special, I'm going to read it and it's going to be, oh, not so great. Yeah. No, so, you know, how do you deal with that? Did, did you feel I fearful? About, yeah, I worried about that because you mm. think these things, I mean, the theatre is so um, ephemeral in loads of ways because it's just about what happens between a group of people. You, you know, the audience is the kind of most important part of that combination and sometimes it is a bit like lightning in a in a bottle is that someone like me will work very hard to try and control those circumstances but a lot of it there is a little element of um you know magical thinking if you like or sort of willful uh, belief and there's something that you know i'm talking about the science of comedy but what is the most delicious aspect of that is really that you can never you can never quite you know you can never quite round up the equation there's always something that's just a little bit mysterious that is beyond our understanding, and that, I think that keeps us honest as people. That's why we like it. Um, but yes, I was nervous about this because this is a treasured one um, and a treasured memory, and it's still, you know, one of one of my favourite shows just because the scale of the achievement was so great and the relationships um, involved in it from the you know, the first time I worked with Ray Smith and um, Paulie Constable, who's become a good friend and a good collaborator, and. You know, lots of, yeah, on a personal designers level... Designers and lighting designers. Yeah, on a personal level, lots of really very important relationships came through the project the first time. And, um, and, and you know, it's been lovely because it feels like a sort of a dear show that I could share it with lovely new colleagues like uh, Nat Parker, who I work with on something else, and Kevin Doyle, who I've worked with, and Steph, and, you know, bring some actors in um, that I hadn't worked with before. So it, feel, it feels like that. Um, so yes, I was nervous about it, but then it's the play. The play is the thing, and it's a brilliantly written play. And then if you follow its instructions, whether they're overt or tacit, it, it'll look do, after you. Do you think it play. is one of the great political plays? <laughs> I think it's just really brilliant. And I think um, as a feat of writing, it's a, it's a magnificent example of most people. I don't know whether this is true to, to your experience as audience members, but I have a theory that most writers write two-handers. And sometimes they'll write a two-hander with eight people on the stage. But it'll be two people talking to each other and the drama progressing in sort of binary units. And I think it's very uncommon to meet a writer who... James was, wasn't even 30 when, when I met him and read the draft. Uh, a, a young writer that could write jokes, that could write ideology, that could write uh, emotion, that could write out of his own experience... Um, that could represent um, a historical time and frame it in a way that it talked directly to our own time. Um, and he could genuinely write uh, a play for 16 actors where, where the drama would progress for each of them, where each installation uh, with a character that seems innocuous is creating a kind of incredibly uh, complex nexus of dramatic momentum so that by the end of it almost unknowingly because you've had such a great time 
you realize that there are hundreds of stories at stake, all coming to a, a fulcrum, a narrative moment uh, that, that comes out of the drama that we've established here and penetrates people's memories of their real experience. And it's an incre I think it's an incredible achievement. Just logistically, it's, uh, he's, he's brilliant. And um, Caro, one of our producers, I saw she put a little tweet out um, where she said, when she saw the first preview, she said, when a, when a new play becomes a classic play. And it, felt, it feels like this is the, the, kind of that part of the, 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 uh, and you've, the story you've, for you've James. You've done a wonderful play. thing as well uh, in terms of bringing the audience into the story. And for those of you who are in tonight or in any other night, there is this wonderful thing that this, the House of Commons bar behind you is a live bar for all of you to buy your drinks in um, at the interval, although I don't think they're 1974 prices. Or, they are, yeah, they they are, are. 1974 for one prices. One only, the, the management have said tonight that it's... Uh, one oh, night only. only yeah, he's only joking. The management is looking ill. Um, right, we have um, a question. Greg, there. Uh, uh, Jacob, Greg's right behind you. Lovely. Thank you. Hi, Jeremy. I wonder whether you could uh, tell us a bit more about how you want to involve the audience in this play, because you've talked about um, introducing some different elements, some headlong elements into the play yeah. itself by the actors. It's not a reconstruction of a House of Commons debate. So can you tell us a bit more about the significance of the set, particularly the fact that we've got these benches here? Yeah. And what, what are you expecting from people who sit on those benches other than just to listen and laugh throughout the production? Yeah, they Thank need you. to listen and laugh throughout the production. That's really in the right places. Um, they don't really have to do anything, but I suppose when we were going through the design and we were trying to work out how do we get a sense of the chamber and the excitement of the chamber and how the benches are teeming, on a, on a night where it's one of the big votes. How do we get that? And, you know, the obvious um, idea was to, we'll sit the audience on them so they're always full. So, uh, you know, when we have our whips engaging as they would with their members, then suddenly you get engaged with. You know, and occasionally um, people on certain sides vote along with the motions <laughs> and they're encouraged to do so, but the show doesn't depend on them because, you know, audience participation is you know, often quite irritating. Um, <laughs> but, but, so it feels like a free and easy, there you go, order. Uh, the member for Chichester. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so it feels like, you know, there's the, an, only, the only involvement is to um, populate the space and allow us to help it work. And I, actually, I was sat there where, where you guys are on the third row. Um, and it's a different experience. It's a wonderful experience. You do feel... I mean, I'm talking about my own show. I sound like an idiot, don't I? But no, I really, I really enjoyed it. It's brilliant. It felt, it felt really yeah. good fun um, last night. You so did actually look like you were having great fun. I was fun having being a great time. I was like, who directed And actually, this? lots of the uh, audience were having a chat to your actors as well. It was That's quite right. hard to, to separate them out. It is a, indeed an honourable Michael Baker. <laughs> Thank you. Um, were these uh, benches and the, uh, the speaker's chair in the uh, London production, or have they been made specially for here? Uh, the speaker, this speaker's chair, I think we had it originally because when I was round the back of it trying to sort out some technical stuff, I noticed that there was some graffiti because when we finished doing it um, in the Olivier... Blooming actors, eh? They took some of the stuff out of the workshops of the National and they populated a, a temporary bar called the Prop Store on the river with a whole load of stuff from, from famous shows. And the speaker's chair was one of them, and people would sit in there and, you know, get their photos taken. But around the back of it, it says something like, Gaz was here, prop, <laughs> prop store 2013. So it feels like this is, a, this is a relic, and that it's staying with us. I think the rest of these benches, um, they were destroyed because they were used in the green room backstage at the National. Uh, so we've made these um, again, but, and these are the ones that are going to, module-like are going to go into the Garrick Theatre with us in a different configuration. <laughs> great. Apparently, um, one, one, of, them. one of my colleagues overheard somebody saying, oh, yes, they've always had these benches here. Oh, They're yeah. very good. Yes, but they look a bit like the House of Commons, don't they? Yes, but they've always <laughs> been like that. That's what we're like here. Gentlemen up there. Sorry, Jacob. Thank you. Is it working? Yes, it is. Um, Kate, I'd, I'd like to ask the director a question that relates to sort of directing a modern play rather than a Shakespeare play. The great thing about Shakespeare is he's not there to criticise what you're doing with his play. But as I understand it, you're quite close to James and he's probably, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, quite directly involved. But equally, it's coming across in this talk that you've got your own creative instincts and, and your own 
assertive character. So question, was there any friction between you and James? And if not, why not? And how did that interplay work? Yeah, well, he's very, very difficult. He's a bully. And um, no, he's just he's the most surprisingly wonderful person. Uh, very open and um, very collaborative. And when he wrote the play, I don't think he imagined this sort of configuration no. at all. I think he imagined it in an end-on theatre with a series of different um, cutting to different uh, different environments, if he'd even imagined it that specifically. So he was kind of very surprised um, when I said, look, I think we should do it like this. And he sort of reeled a bit, thinking, what? I've never seen anything like that before. And then immediately understood that it was going to be incredibly helpful to his drama. Um, but yeah, but I don't think there's been a moment of tension, actually. There, um, there hasn't been any arguments or fallouts, which is very rare, because you have those, because quite right, too. I mean, it's a bit... In, the only thing I can think of it like is, um, is, is like bringing up a child with somebody. You know, there's, a, there's moments of tension in that experience, I can tell you that. And um, because it's so important to you, I suppose, and the stakes are really high, and, and collaborating on a, on a play is... Is a is a is a kind of similar level of need, but James is super cool. I think he was very confident, very gentle man, yeah, isn't, isn't he? Yeah. Very, but gentle. very smart. And you know, even if he does have a problem with something, I imagine he's got a, a gentle diplomacy about him that he would manage to shepherd you away from from a course of action that would upset him without you feeling terrible about anything. So yeah, it was a really, really brilliant collaboration. And I love to work like that. I don't like... Um, I mean, I can do uh, conflicts and I can do all of that stuff, but I, I don't find it particularly creative. I like an atmosphere where everybody is really valued and looked after and that they can express themselves to be the most um, creative uh, territory. So James seems to be on, on board with that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, right, Gent gentleman there and then a lady there. Yeah. How much did you, if you could try to match the physical characteristics of various MPs and uh, two, because for example, Audrey Wise straight away was Audrey Wise, and the one person I did know was Fred Sylvester. Oh yeah. Who was, I was at school with him, he was oh, really? MP for West Walthamstow, and it, he was always stooping, always had those heavy glasses, and I, I said to my wife, even before he spoke, that's Fred Sylvester. Fantastic. And he's, I mean, he's not a major figure in it, but he's absolutely super. That's great, yeah. He is Fred. That's great, and we have our little jokes about his posture, how terrible his posture is. Uh, it's important. Hesseltine's to, hair. Yeah, Hesseltine's <laughs> hair is a winner. I mean, you know, we try and do a gesture towards the people that would remember them, but also to make them vivid enough to people that wouldn't. And that's the that's the shtick about the. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen it, is that the members. So it's based around the whip's office, but, and various members come in with their various issues and various problems. And the members are always referred to by their constituency name, as a way of slightly taking away from the politics of personality and asserting the idea that that's what these people are doing here. They're representing a community, they're representing a part of the country. Um, and so, you know, it feels like a very national uh, play for, th for that. But it also gives us a little bit of leeway when it comes to having to cast... I should really find out how many characters are in the play. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot yeah. of wig work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it's crazy back there. I mean, if you think it's chaotic and sort of busy out here, in terms of these little areas where we have quick change, it's you know teams. It's like a Formula One pit stop where people are just radically altered into someone else, and sent back on, and they come back on. They're doing a different accent. They're doing uh, someone else. Some someone said uh, a, a nice thing that I've heard today was someone said that they couldn't believe there were only two actresses in it. That they thought there were twenty actresses in it. Yeah. Because um, Lauren, they are outnumbered. Yeah, well, women. of course yeah, they are. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to engage with um, you know, the, the feminism of the piece whilst representing actually what it was like in those days where women were, were um, completely... In fact, Edwina Curry came to see it and she thought we'd completely over-represented the women that were around. Oh, well. because she, yeah. But she would, I suppose. Um, <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so Sarah Woodward does an incredible job by being far too many people than you think is possible. Lady there, thank you. Yes, hello. Um, um, in the National and here, where it's open plan, thinking of the Garrick, the more traditional layout of the theatre, how will you do the set and involve? Um, 
<laughs> you know, uh, yeah. thinking well, it's, of the auditorium. It's going to be different, you know, but then it's going to be really exciting. We're going to do it uh, with the two offices behind the, the pros, but the actors are going to come in through the auditorium. Some of the angels that you can't see that you might be able to see later will go into the auditorium, so we'll slightly invade that territory. Uh, instead of a central lobby, we'll have a, a, a sort of lobby downstage. So it'll, you know, it'll be the same sort of rooms, but in a skewed configuration. But will the benches with the audience? They'll be, be on the stage. Involved. They'll all. Oh. Yeah. So we've got two layers. So this will all be on the stage. Um, there'll be a couple of uh, rows. So it'll have, it'll feel, it'll feel the same. But it feels like this, this play is really, it's really possible to, to re kind of reform, depending on the room that it's in, because we, this is the third room that we've done and. I think the Garrick will probably be the biggest challenge, but... It um, lends itself, doesn't yeah. it? It feels right in here. It yeah, feels right in it'll, here. it'll play... I mean, what, you, what we'll get in the Garrick is we'll be able to play to a huge group of people, and that might, you know, from what I was saying before, that might just sharpen the, the comedy a little bit. Um, and we'll find, you know, you, we'll find ways when we're in there to, to just settle in and to make it feel mm. yeah. great. Yeah. The complicated thing about any evening of theatre is the relationship of the actor and the text and the audience. And as long as that is uncluttered and can tell the story, we'll be absolutely fine because it feels like that's the, that's the hard work that we've spent in rehearsals. And the rest of it is just kind of detail and, and uh, you know, tinkering, my sort of tinkering. Well, it, it was the most incredible evening in the theatre and everybody has a, a, an extraordinary treat to come. You've got a beautiful company together um, and I have no doubt it's going to be even more successful than it's been. So, ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Heron. Jeremy Heron.